Our moderator for this session will be Ms. Amel El Kohaji, Managing Director of Human Capital Development Advisory. Joining Amel will be Ms. Dana Bhaji, Chief Human Resources Officer of the National Bank of Bahrain, Jordana Saman, Head of HR, Gulf and Asia Invest Corp Holdings, Dr. Susan Hetrick, Vice President and Group Head of HRD Bank ABC, and Aurora Nolasco, Senior Manager, Human Resources, DHL Express. I would like to think that I would like to empower men to enter HR, which is the warrior job nowadays. So um, just to start, I would like to introduce my panel, dear panelists, uh, in, in a little bit of a different way. You all know where they work, they were introduced and you have their profiles and the collaterals of the conference but I'd like to introduce them by alphabetical order and a, a slight different, slightly different angle. Aurora, um, Aurora has um, nearly uh, uh, a long, a long years of experience, 21 years in Bahrain, a mother of six. Uh, Aurora is, um, likes to be known as uh, an HR business partner. Her values are integrity while striving to do what's right in every circumstance. She wants to be known as being resilient. Her dream is that engagement uh, and energy and positive levels after this COVID um, of all teams remain high. And if she had a magic wand, which is a question I asked everyone, she would like a, an empathy wand uh, to, or, to create a more tolerant and less aggressive and civic world. Going on to our next panelist, Dana Bohidji, um, uh, also I think ended up in HR uh, due to her real calling uh, she started in finance and uh, in the financial world, in the Ministry of Finance, Montelicat, EDB, and now NBB's HR, Chief HR. And I think um, she saw it in her that this is the calling that I was uh, made for, I guess. And uh, that's why she would like to be known as someone who is very passionate about enhancing people's appreciation of the power of self-empowerment. So it's all about self-empowerment with Donna. And one word that describes her is self-integrity. Post-corona, she wants to see a more resilient workforce. And if she had a magic wand, she wishes for the world opening up again so that she can travel and explore on a personal level. Uh, if, uh, next, we have Jordana Sam'an who also accidentally bumped into HR after being in business development in F1, but then she moved on to work in the um, shipping and logistics um, in, in, in Saudi Arabia, uh, and then in, in Bahrain APM terminals, and is now uh, HR in, um, in Best Corp, head of HR in Gulf and Asia. She is an extrovert who wants to change the world in the right way. She's very passionate about life and she's persistent. And you will see that in the discussions. Uh, her wish and dream post Corona is to have a more diverse workforce. And um, I think if she had a magic wand, she says she wants to see a fairer, equal and tolerant world and uh, more positive inclusion. Susan Hetrick, um, 30 years of experience, and I don't think accidentally in HR because she is someone who has been in HR for 30 years. She'd like to be known as a warrior for good. Her values are collaboration, compassion, integrity, continuous learning. She's very passionate about life. Post Corona, her one dream is to have women leaders so that we can achieve a more balanced and representative workforce. And, um, and I think um, Susan brings, uh, will bring a lot of um, interesting experience to this panel uh, because she has a doctorate in corporate culture and she's a published author in this, um, in this field. And she's worked in many countries like the UK, US, Poland, and Bahrain. 
uh, starting our HR and focus panel session, uh, the role of HR. I think in this pandemic, we all um, would agree that the role of HR has been highlighted positively. It has been reinforced positively. I think the role of HR is, is phenomenally going to change the, the profession itself. So for all those HR professionals out there and managers out there, listen to this panel and learn from each experience that will be uh, shared with us today. Each of these panelists work for entities that that will that, that can teach us a lot. I could be uh, I, I could I could say that they are benchmark um, companies that we can learn from because I did a lot of research trying to find out um, uh, more about what's going on and uh, during the pandemic, what's happening to with HR roles, what's happening to organizations, and all I can conclude is that even though um, forty percent of companies uh, shut down certain departments, eighty three percent adjusted their business practices, uh, still uh, COVID-19 casts a very new light to the role of HR. And now, HR professionals, it's time for us to reassert our leadership to build new ways of working that create sustainability, and that's the key word for our organizations and our people. So I'd like to start by um, uh, talking about the obvious thing, which is working remotely. Uh, I'd like to address this question to Jordana and then um, soon, soon move after, um, I mean, anyone who would like to add, of course, our dear panelists are uh, very welcome to add anything they like about a certain topic. But Jordana, we, we chatted about this sometime and um, working, um, I think we chatted about it a year or two ago when you were in a, here at VIVF in a millennial versus generation X debate. And we were talking about working remotely as a, a demand from millennials. And it, it's very interesting that now organizations had to face it and had to adjust and had to make it happen. So I'd like to pose this question to you. Uh, what has been your experience in adjusting the work from home uh, versus office life? And what sort of controls have you put in place? Is it, and what happened to this element of trust versus control of attendance and tracking? And can you please share the, that, that experience with us from an Invescorp's, Invescorp's uh, perspective? Okay. Um, hi. Thank you, Emel, for that introduction. And hello, world, as Emel said. Thank you, BIBF, for including me in this. I think the work from home versus work from work um, has obviously been pushed forward due to COVID. Uh, studies have shown about 41% of companies were not prepared, and COVID sort of was the catalyst to make them to, make, to enforce them to do it, right? So for us, I think that the biggest change was in the beginning, a lot of people were quite resistant. So we had people though, although they wanted it previously, as we said in, in last year's panel, um, millennials want to work from home, being forced to do it is very different than when you're choosing to do it. So at the beginning, it was a little bit difficult. People found structuring their days quite hard, having kids at home. Um, don't forget, obviously, the world came to a standstill. So it wasn't that you had an escape either. It was you were at home 24-7. So that adjustment the first two to three weeks was difficult. Um, from an HR point of view, a lot of people were texting me all the time saying, we want to go back to work. We want to go back to work. This is really hard. Um, post that, I would say... 21 days, almost like the um, habit. It takes 21 days to make habit. Post that 21 days, people suddenly thrived. They got themselves into a proper routine. They got themselves into a system. So it started to work. Now, in terms of controls, we have a lot of trust in our employees. 
So the same way that we didn't look at, I mean, for us person, we didn't look at attendance if you come in or not. It's about doing your job, right? So different departments, different uh, managers have different ways of the way they monitor their teams. The one thing that we as HR encouraged was checking in almost on a daily basis. I mean, it's very different when you're in the office and you see somebody walk by um, or you can walk around and go to your teammates. When you're working from home, checking in on them was quite important. So we sort of push that people have daily check-ins with their teams, sort of see what everyone is up to. And then from there, it's spread to then to go to weekly. And then that is where you have the control. So you have objectives that you still have to meet. You have deadlines that you still have to meet. How and when you do them is on the individual. So there wasn't this, oh, you must sort of report and send an email. I'm, you know, I'm now at my desk. And then at the end of the day, I'm now done. It wasn't done that way. So we really gave a lot of trust to the employees um, that they are to work around what deems fit for them. Maybe you were uh, more structured, I would say, and ready for it. Maybe the control mechanisms of uh, not control per se, but uh, probably systems that allowed for tracking of information, tracking of projects, tracking of tasks were there. Uh, maybe we move on to another industry, maybe not the financial sector, and ask Aurora on how um, uh, DHL um, managed to, 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 to track, um, let's say, performance. And what you uh, and other panelists, if you'd like to share, uh, what are your plans on performance management and performance appraisals this year? How will they look like and what, they will, look, what will they look like? Have, have changes been made uh, to this uh, structure? Well, thank you very much, Amal, and uh, I'd like to thank the IVF for the invitation as well. Um, I very much echo what Jordana has just mentioned in some aspects. Uh, definitely empowerment uh, is one of the key words that we've put into practice. Uh, we talk about empowerment all the time uh, within our workforce, but this was really uh, the extreme of allowing people um, to really make their own decisions and to be partnering with the business. Um, now, uh, in terms of KPIs, in terms of measuring performance, we have very much maintained a similar module than what we had, simply because we are a global company. Uh, sometimes teleworking is possible, sometimes it's not possible. Um, our uh, associates, our employees, they do travel quite a bit, so working remotely is not really something very new to us. Okay. Um, in terms of challenges, yes, there was a little bit of the, the life-work balance uh, where the environment is slightly different. But in terms of going back to your question on how we measure performance, um, yes, we are very much in line to what we used to do. Uh, in certain aspects, a little bit different, uh, a little bit remotely, yes, reporting and uh, Zoom calls and obviously uh, the, the technology kicks in a little bit stronger when uh, meetings on one-on-one -on -one are not possible. Okay, Aurora, um, and maybe this question is also for the corporate culture master and guru in the panel, Susan. Uh, people want to be recognized. And I think uh, I read um, a study, a uh, shrimp study, saying that the one third of the uh, workers or employees don't feel recognized, don't feel appreciated with all this remote work. Because at the end of the day, seeing people in the office gives a lot of acknowledgement to what they're doing and, and, and remote work removes that, makes everything invisible. So what do you have to say about that, Susan? Is Susan with us on the call? I am with you. I am yeah, with you. Sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there was, there's a technology. Um, thank you, BIBF. Thank you, Amal. Thank you to the fellow panelists. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, very interesting questions that you, you've just raised about engagement and how we engage. And we've known for a long time as HR professionals that our challenge is constantly about engaging all our people. Uh, if possible, most of the time, and if not all the time. Um, and we've always had a high, relatively high percentage in every organization you look at in good or bad times around engagement. Um, I'd like to think of this crisis, and it has been a crisis, 
represented by the Chinese character. I don't know if you know that the Chinese word for uh, crisis is represented by two characters. One character represents danger and the other represents opportunity. Absolutely. It's that thing about, the, yes, we are in this, tra the world is going through this trauma together, um, but culture is the glue that really holds us together. And culture has always been invisible. And I think the challenge is, how can we best capitalize on the technology that we have to evolve a culture that is not only just digital, but robust and compassionate? Um, can I just talk to you a little bit about where I think we, we are going with this? I think, you know, we've, we have kept one eye on the well-being of our people. We run a survey recently, rather like Jordana and Aurora mentioned, we did a survey around our well-being. Um, two thirds actually were very, thought very positive and very engaged in the work they were, they were doing. Um, so for us, I think we, we are looking for a future where our leaders or leadership is changing and that is part of a culture. And our leaders need to uh, prepare for the worst yet imagine the best. And then what do I mean by preparing for the worst and imagine the best? And we've heard of this terminology called VUCA. Um, you know, that the world is becoming increasingly volatile, um, uncertain, chaotic and, ambi and ambiguous. And I've been through crisis, the global financial crisis, other crises in the past. Mm -hmm. Nothing. This is unprecedented. This VUCA has is, turned the world upside down. So I, I was reflecting on this um, from our discussions that we had, and I was thinking, there's a new VUCA. There's, a, there's the V, the V now stands for corporate values. And as organizations, we have to remain true to the values we have. And we are seeing organizations which some of us would think are not behaving as well as what they're saying their corporate values are. You know, they are um, paying their dividends and yet furloughing their staff. We've seen that in, in big organizations like mm -hmm. Disney uh, in, in the States. And it's not what you'd imagine organizations to be doing. So I think this V about our values is very, we have to stay steady on our values and who we are as we come through this crisis. The U I think is a bit more around understanding and understanding we have clients who are in more difficult situations. We need to understand where they are. We need to understand the challenges. We're seeing a tipping point on social justice around the world that we've not seen for many, many years. Um, so I think as HR professionals, we know going into the new world, I think a lot more is going to be around diversity and inclusion. And I think our stakeholders and our communities will expect to see more on this. Then we're seeing um, C, I think, is around compassion. We've recognised that everybody as they've gone through this has, has done this differently. I think, you know, it's very interesting, Jordana mentioned about the first 21 days and then people got into the habit. I think it was such a trauma at the beginning. Um, it was, it, we didn't know quite how it was gonna, what was happening or, and somehow we've all kind of managed this in our own ways. We've all had good days and up days. So I think continuous focus on wellbeing is going to be, is going to be important. But I think also the A increasingly now for VUCA, the A stands for agility. The, is not about how quickly we can make decisions, but it's also the opportunity to imagine the art of the possible. What can be done? And we were talking around this. I mean, it's changed on a personal basis, it's changed my perspective. I'm now taking art classes with a fantastic artist in New York who teaches at the school. We're doing this virtually. He stands, you know, I have my phone. It's, we can almost travel the world virtually that we've, we've never done. So yeah, I think the possibilities are endless. And um, thank you for the VUCA. <laughs> uh, I think uh, we'll come back to this. Um, and I think um, you're absolutely right. I think most of your magic wand um, uh, answers were around inclusion and diversity. And I think this is um, a time where um, we have been slapped by this pandemic in the face and and it's a huge wake-up call for everyone but i i i would like um to look at it positively and i do really truly truly believe i've been in so many discussions social non-social professional as well 
about this and I see a lot of positivity coming out of this. I think confinement as a word, I was just in a women's chat um, across the globe actually with a lot of women talking about confinement only. And uh, confinement is in the head. It's not, you know, if you feel confined, you are confined. But if you don't feel confined, physical confinement means nothing. Virtual uh, and technology, um, you know, uh, tools have allowed us to go way beyond, like you said, you wouldn't have thought of getting a, an art teacher in New York on normal circumstances, but now you do. And you have the, that benefit. So I think, I think yes, um, but, but I'll go back to the organization itself. I'll go back maybe, um, and maybe uh, Donna, you can talk about this uh, now a little and then, uh, and then other panelists can add. Uh, when we talk about realities of the organization, when we're talking about cost management, when we're talking about changes maybe that can, uh, many, we know that many, many people, uh, many companies change their remuneration, company cuts. What's happened to the reality of the world of costs? You know, Donna, can you help us start that discussion and, and how that probably as an HR professional, we struggle as professionals in HR, we struggle with that. You know, we struggle with our organizations trying to get the budgets for things that they think are soft, but we think are essential. And now it's worse because, because budgets are even str more stringent. So uh, wh what is your take on that, Donna? Um, hi, everyone. And uh, thanks, Emil. Thanks for this. And uh, hi to all the panelists and, and our attendees. And many thanks to the BRBF for giving us this opportunity. I love the way that you sort of built up towards this question because I feel that it can sort of open the door and holistically tie in everything that my fellow panelists were, were sharing and talking about. Um, I like always to have a very sort of uh, practical angle uh, to our ambitions and our, and our thoughts. And I'm sure that it has sort of materialized in different ways in those uh, various organizations. Allow me to share with you uh, the steps that we took, and um, especially that this was new to us. We weren't prepared for it. Um, we are working with a, a, a comparatively big task force for a local organization and which, with people that are dispersed. So culture has always been something that we have worked to enhance holistically as a group. And we tapped into practically um, uh, channels for increasing um, internal communication, for example. Uh, we addressed all the challenges through uh, a focus on training through webinars, which uh, we kicked off in May. Uh, that in a way impacted our costs. So that balance between being able to deliver uh, what, you know, as HR professionals and people who are leaders within organizations aspire to do, uh, which is continuously evolve and, and, and advance uh, our areas. Um, you can, if you think creatively, actually come up with, with the assistance of technology, of course, more cost-effective ways of doing that. So today, I'll, I'll, I'll cite for you um, the changes we've done to our training model, for example. Uh, we had a traditional model before that taps into, you know, training needs analysis, I'd, focusing on that per individual, and then aligning potential trainings to the needs and so forth. Uh, what we did in, in May was a complete revamp of that. Uh, we came up with our virtual training calendar and we uh, created uh, training opportunities that are um, across the board. Um, we, you know, we cover areas that we felt were needed. So we supported staff through this migration of culture. You know, working remotely was covered. How do you monitor performance um, given the circumstances was covered. Um, you know, how do you deal with the challenges of the situation was covered. Also, updates on, on the economy or updates on the relevant areas. Electronic signatures, for example, became something very, very relevant today. Uh, what's the latest from a legal perspective? What can we do uh, to enhance that and support that, uh, you know, with, as function uh, leaders? The beauty of the, the revised approach using technology is we opened it up for everyone. So that had a huge impact on our cost. Uh, we ended up on costs uh, per training per hour very much reduced because today through this um, you know platform, uh, just like the one you're using now, Zoom, we could have we could run trainings that 
uh, covered hundreds of people at the same time. So the benefit was really extended. And for those that haven't explored this uh, venue, I seriously urge you to do so. I hear a lot uh, from the market that people are looking into adopting this model going forward. So it satisfies many, many facets. So going back to your question in terms of, you know, how do we manage uh, controlling costs at such a times without impacting our overall strategy and direction, I think with innovation and creativity. I think that's something that's very much doable. Um, I, within our area, obviously there is the whole manpower planning element of cost control. You revise your, your manpower plan, whether or not you can accommodate as many uh, recruitments and hires. I think that's a no brainer that every one of us, I'm sure, uh, had to think about. But then to explore other venues that haven't been explored before. And I think you can achieve a, a balance and in, in still keeping costs at bay, but then continuing to enhance uh, what yeah, you're here I, to enhance. I think, I think um, you know, uh, technology enables us to, to, to go to the masses and keep things going on. But I, I often wonder until when, and, and maybe I had that chat with Susan talking about um, what defines corporate culture in normal days can be very difficult now. Has this changed our plans or not? Are we, uh, as, 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 as a collective you know, entity, are we invisible to each other? What defines us as a group? Since remoteness has been imposed upon us, it's not something that we chose. Are we getting used to this remoteness? What's the sense of belonging? Where's the, the dreams, the aspirations, the progression? Everything is in, I, th I think even people um, like you, uh, we have like a, a, a thing hitting us every month, you know, it, either Corona and a couple of months and then, and then what's happening to the world with social injustice and discrimination. And it's so many things going on. So engagement is at the key. I'm, I'm conscious of time and I want to um, ask questions from the audience to keep it more lively, but I would still like my panelists to to, to attack that sort of role of HR and keeping people productive, focused, uh, so that we don't, so, so that we affect the bottom line positively, okay, uh, while not firefighting. You know, I, I think there's a lot of firefighting solutions, but we need to realize that what's the new norm, basically, yeah, uh, and 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 how are we tackling that? I'd like Aurora to. Uh, probably take this question to you about engagement and how you uh, talked about uh, managers being accountable um, for this now. Yeah, um, well, for us, employee engagement is really a key factor in our employee value proposition uh, in norm, uh, now more than ever. Uh, one thing that does not change, we can talk about the changes, we can talk about uh, all sorts of aspects, but one thing that does not change is that people want to feel valued and they want to contribute to the business. And from us, from an HR perspective, we need to always be one step ahead, uh, now more than ever. Uh, and we need to plan ahead. So. At, from a DHL perspective, I can uh, speak on, uh, you know, at a local level, I'm already working on the back to work, uh, on a phase back to work. How is this going to, to roll out? For us, we have a very simple model. Motivated people drives quality in service, which is then linked to loyal customers, which is linked to revenue and investment. And that investment in, in turn is really uh, going back to motivating our people and providing the tools to, for the business. How do we do it in this space? Uh, now, health and well-being is a, a huge topic for us. It has uh, become really, really um, evident and active uh, in a different way. Yes, remotely. Um, we have faced the challenges, and again, agility being the word, I'm just going to echo what uh, Dr. Suzanne has mentioned earlier. Agility for us is also key. Resilience is also key. Um, facing the challenges, identifying that opportunities 
for us to, to really lead this into a positive note. For us, the downtime, the teleworking activity, allowed time for reflection as well. Um, people used to be busy on nine to five jobs, coming to the office, you know, having their coffee and closing their office at five o'clock and going home. Nowadays, there is no stipulated schedule sometimes. Uh, so this has allowed for reflection, self-reflection re re of, of, of the people as well. So that was an opportunity for us to then work on health and well-being, on obviously communication in a different way, WhatsApp groups and, and so forth in order to engage our, our people. Mm. So, I, think, I think I read somewhere that the top struggle for employees nowadays is uh, nowadays is unplugging from work because they're actually uh, have to be plugged on 24 hours. So that's another challenge. Susan, um, I'd like to uh, move to you and, 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 and talk about this invisible kind of, you know, what, what this pandemic has imposed upon us as a collective sort of, uh, you know, workforce. I think in practical terms, um, it's, it's made HR become the glue of the organization. You know, we've taken the opportunity, we've had, uh, we've had a digital ABC Academy in place for the last couple of years. It means 24 seven access for all our staff around the world, both to banking and finance, but also to management and leadership libraries. Um, we've been running webinars. We have almost been writing, how do you behave when you're managing remote workers? We've run, we've done uh, a manager's guide, um, colleague, we've done a, a staff guide, we've been writing a performance management guide, performance management and leadership because it's all very intertwined together. But we, so we've taken an opportunity almost to do the things that we've been hoping to do, wanting to do, but somehow just haven't had the bandwidth in which to do it. So yeah. we're now really up in our game and we're starting to look at career development, career progression through the organisation how to have a career conversation as a member of staff. So I think for us that we're looking really about how do we bring that engagement of people across and make sure that we've got a platform of resources that all managers and staff can dip into and know that this is the culture, how to, how to behave, how to act, what's, what does good look like? That's what we've been pushing for. Yeah. I'll, I'll engage um, Jordana just in the last thought before we move on to the questions. Um, Jordana, I'm sure, because um, I know you, you would agree that um, I think this was and is a good time to reset the clock. I think we're, um, we want to look back or we will look back at COVID-19 epidemic um, being the catalyst for a better way of living, a better way uh, of um, managing our people so um how 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 do you feel about uh the push that we got to change and what are the major changes that you have like experienced okay um i think that with this the major the major change that's going to happen is that managers and leaders are going to have to let go a little bit on those those leaders that micromanage they will really have to change their mindset. They're going to have, have to- they? Ha has this, in your, in your judgment, has this uh, kind of, at this point of time, uh, I know you can't meet the managers and do your assessments properly, but do you feel it has changed them, truly? So for now it has, yes, because they've been forced to, right? Mm -hmm. um, we, like others have mentioned, um, especially Susan said about over-communicating, this is the time to over-communicate. This is the time to reach out to people. This is the time to sort of, um, you, you talked about culture previously, Emel, on how to continue the culture when everyone's remote working. That over-communication is how you continue it. So it's very easy within teams to do it, but when you have your leaders, so your, your C-suite team doing virtual town halls, right? And talking about what they plan, what their strategy, how they feel today, that will filter down. And then there's no ambiguity of, well, you know, my manager heard in a meeting. No, it's there for the people to take Absolutely. and then it's the yeah. um, One thing I want, I know you want to move to Q&A, but I, I glanced at the questions. And one question that I want to touch upon so we can kind of pass out is 
someone mentioned <laughs> multitasking. Somebody <laughs> asked a question, if, if your HR is very administrative and doesn't do team building, training and development, et cetera, what do you do? So I've been asked this question before. And as Emma said, I wasn't in HR for the first almost eight years of my career. Do it yourself. Don't wait for someone else to do stuff for you. Don't always wait for the company to hand you what you need. We live in a time where technology is very available to everyone. Uh, we live in a time where everything is available to you online. The way Susan is doing art lessons with someone in New York, you can easily go onto YouTube and watch a TED talk with your team on motivation, on how to be a better leader, on how to be a better employee. So do it together. If you are not in an organization that recognizes it yet, if you don't have an HR team, maybe that understands the core HR is still quite operational, which there are many out there. You can't blame them. It's what they've learned then you do it, you build that team. And even if you're not a manager, do it within your peers. Get together and decide together what you think is better for the organization. And if the four of you do it, believe me, it has a domino effect. If you take it seriously, then well, this team will another team make and then you can spread it. it, it will spread. So I just wanted to tell you, now you can Okay, it. good, you, do, you, you answered that question. So moving on to one of the questions, how do you see the work from home environment affecting the new norm? Will this, I think we addressed part of that, but will this new norm affect the salary schemes? So who would like to have a go on salaries? Uh, we know that in many companies, maybe not the ones that we're speaking to or you're representing today, uh, but we know in many sectors, um, COVID has hit uh, extremely, um, badly the bottom lines very badly and and um it has affected salary schemes so but but would anyone like to comment on that donna maybe sure uh honestly i don't think there's a correlation between working from home um and uh, and you know the compensation design as a whole uh, i think uh, sort of compensation design is more strategic and it's more aligned to the positioning of the organization and uh, where it falls within its industry. Um, if we continue to tap into the right tools and uh, ensure productivity is maintained or increased, then there's absolutely no link there. Now, you know, where are we heading given the circumstances? I think- And the what value is... that person is adding, I guess, that People definitely, definitely. Yeah. And, you know, again, I think this is sort of, I, I totally agree with Jordana in the sense that this is helping everyone transform into the better versions of themselves as managers, because you realize now that you can't tap into your traditional ways anymore. It's really more at a higher level. I, I personally have a, a positive experience myself because, uh, you know, I had a team that was more dispersed. And now, thanks to technology, I'm able to connect with each one a lot more and I think this has made me a better manager yeah, I think and impacted them positively as well. Yeah, this is more of a mechanical question probably and, a, and an administrative question because many are asking, I can see that uh, and are concerned about some companies thinking, okay, since you're not going to gyms or clothes, we stop gym allowances. Um, you don't travel to work, we're gonna stop transportation allowances. So it's those small things that people who are you know, worried about, employees are worried, worried about? I think as responsible um, participants in the overall team, we need to all uh, play a role in really understanding what we're going through collectively and uh, take responsibility a bit uh, towards that. So if you're in an industry or in an area that's highly impacted by what's happening and it's hitting your bottom line, I think um, it's easier for you to understand uh, if there are more creative ways into looking into how can we better manage as a team? Because for us to survive and to continue and to thrive, we have to do it together, right? And um, that's where people, and, and you know, enhanced sort of internal comms, people really understanding the bigger picture. And I totally agree with using the platforms uh, available today for town halls, for team connections, uh, to just ho help in explaining and ensuring that we're all aligned in terms I of understanding where we stand. I word here. Thank you, Donna. And uh, communication allows that alignment. And this yeah. virtual platforms allowing uh, maybe the C-suite to have a little bit more time for these larger uh, schemes. Yeah. 
which otherwise would have happened in a hotel with a lot of logistics and preparation. Now it's easier to have these larger communication platforms. I think, yes, alignment communication creates that alignment. And therefore, I think they become part of the process of the decision making. If, the, if there are any cuts or if there are any changes, exactly. the staff become part of that decision making. So C-suite, learn that, over communicate, <laughs> over communicate, because that is very important. I have another question. How can you foster an environment of trust between your employees? I think that's a very generic question. Uh, but um, I mean, maybe maybe one of you can have a go at it. Maybe Aurora and Susan. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Um, well, I, again, collaboration is something that we evidently work on intensively these days. And uh, when we talk about communication in terms of just sending out uh, information. Um, seeking fee feedback and ensuring that people really collaborate uh, across the board is, is really something that we focus on uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I, okay. I think maybe Suzanne would like want to elaborate a little bit more. Thanks, Aurora. Um, I, I think you know we're we're seeing sort of like leadership is is tr about trust, and we we've. Uh, We've known this, but I think this is even more respect and trust is critical. The micromanager of being able to see sort of like somebody's coat on the back of the chair or actual presenteeism, we need, we've said for a long time, it's not about inputs, it's about outputs mm -hmm. um, that we need to be looking at. So I think being um, authentic as a, as a leader, I think being, um, People talk about uh, leaders eating last, in other words, making sure you understand what the team, where individuals are, where they're, what they're thinking, how you bring the team together. All of that is going to be critical. So as I say, you know, the leaders of the, of the, of the future need to, kind of, we need to have people with strong levels of imagination and build sort of levels of trust throughout that and respect. Fortunately, we, do, we still have companies, Susan, that ha would ask their employees to have the cameras on all the time and, and, and during this, this, the, yeah. these days. So the, the lack of trust really is, 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 is very sad. Can, I, can sad I just come back to the other question about how it affects salary scheme? Go ahead. Look, Go ahead. I just think we need to look at it in a different way. We, we, we know that some of the large organizations like Barclays are really questioning about why they have offices in the first place when we could all work so effectively from home. What are the costs that we could take out from renting offices? So, so the new norm is different. <laughs> yeah. and, and actually, I, I think working from home has always been for me, and I've been doing it for in other organizations like the World Bank Group, everybody, you, you took, I think it's a very intense. I think what we need to do is learn that because you haven't got the social interaction mm -hmm. as regular as you have and it can be a very intense period where you're feeling right I've got to be here these are the hours this yeah. is what I've got to deliver. I think one good thing that this pandemic came up with is forced us to do it I've been I've been preaching it for a very long time uh, uh, not total work from home but like you know when needed and this output driven culture and um, I think uh, um, it, it, it's, a, you know, it's just a catalyst of, of, of getting it done. But I think, yes, it's a learning process for all. It's a learning process for organizations to um, learn how to do it and have the proper systems in place to track um, with trust and not, you know, because they don't have the system, they're probably tracking without trust, you know, so uh, they don't have the means. So it, 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 it's very interesting what, what's going to come out of this. I always say that, um, before I move on to the next question, I always say like with schools, my, 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 I'm a daughter, uh, I have two daughters and one's 11 years old and, and she hates virtual schooling. But, um, you know, what they don't know is kids don't know how to learn virtually. They have not been taught to learn virtually. But what's worse is teachers don't know how to teach virtually. It's not the tool, it's not the camera, it's not Google Hangouts, it's, it's more than that. It's the psychology behind teaching virtually and how do you teach children virtually and how do you engage them? 
So it's really, really um, a learning process for all. I, I'll move on to the next question. It says, as companies are working on upskilling and reskilling the workforce to meet the new reality of a virtual delivery of products and services, which skill amongst your employees have you found most important? What I will do with this question is ask you all panelists just to say one word. Which skill do you think is most important? Aurora. Um, which skill? Being able to adapt yourself to change. Adaptation. I said one word. Okay. <laughs> so yeah. that, resilience. There you resilience, go. Adaptive resilience. That's my word. That was going to be my word. Resilience. Okay. okay. Um, it's okay if it's repeated. No problem. Donna? Agility. Agility. Okay. Susan? Leadership. Leadership for, for all of us, whatever level we are. We have a choice to be a leader and how to see ourselves through this crisis. Okay, fantastic. Uh, agility is also, I think, um, absolutely, uh, uh, you know, agile leaders, you know, it sums it all up. Agile leaders are, are resilient, are adaptive. So I think all of you agree that um, um, we have to have that as a skill in our managers, in our staff, uh, and our every sort of every level of of, of uh, employees in the organization and even in our kids, <laughs> okay. But um, but also agile systems in place, uh, agile processes and procedures in place. I would think because it all supports that agile mindset of the whole organization and not only the people, you know, that that have it. So. Um, HR probably um, is the glue. I totally, I like that. It has been the glue of the organizations nowadays and uh, the importance of the roles, uh, the role of HR has been really highlighted massively. And I think the, the, this, this, this phenomenal uh, change is happening to uh, our roles uh, these days and we have to lead the change. I'll ask, um, I'll ask uh, one final quick, please, very, very quick notes because we only have a few minutes left. I think we've finished, we're finished. No time for words. Okay, just one word or two, three words from each, not a long sentence, please. And we conclude and thank you so much for my beautiful, beautiful panelists. Uh, I heard that the other panel was all men, the technology panel, and this one is all women. So I don't know where the empowerment has to take place, but anyways, uh, one word from you, Aurora, final conclusion. Well, word of advice, word of advice, just a very quick word of advice. advice. The, what can I say? HR is a regulator to us, it's no longer. Um, it's more the HR business partner and really understanding the business and really facilitating the business success. Um, Absolutely. Donna, thank you. Donna? I would just encourage everyone uh, to engage and stay connected. I think at times like this, we need each other. And definitely tapping into what I've heard today is going to add a lot of value to how I think about it going forward. Absolutely. Stay connected. Jordana? I'd just like to tell everyone, whatever changes you want to see, as cliche as it sounds, be that change. It will have a ripple effect. Thank you very much, Jordana. Yes, Susan? I think uh, to echo that, be the change that you want to see in the world. Yes, and I think it's time for all of us to take that step. I think as human beings and as HR professionals that are um, maybe, yes, we're faced with this change, faced with this pandemic, but created so much change because we had to, and we just have to embody that positively and go out there and, and um, uh, create that positive impact for our organizations and humanity at large. Thank you so much. I was very, um, I'm very uh, happy to have met you again, some of you and some of you to have known you for the first time, Dr. Susan. Uh, and thank you BIBF again for having um, uh, chosen this topic because, and, and have this beautiful panelists chosen. 
thank you so much and have a great uh, day ahead.